So there are notes, at least for the first two lectures, uh, they're putting it on the web page. So hopefully by tomorrow or Tuesday, you'll have the second two lectures. OK, so there's a new ingredient that I'll describe today. Which So I've given already, I guess, three sets of lectures at ICTP on pure spinner formalism. But there's a new ingredient now that um, I think is better understood, which is where the formalism comes from. So I'll spend um, today. Uh, today I have two lectures, so I'll spend most of today's lectures discussing these new ingredients. So let me start with motivation. And then, to simplify things, I will discuss first the superparticle. So the superparticle is, of course, the massless degree of freedom in the string. And most of the issues that come up in the string already come up in the particle or in the superparticle. So I'll discuss this in three different languages. So first with Green-Schwartz, then with pure spinner. And then finally, I'll give this twister-like description, which will generalize to the string. And in some sense, this will be, unlike these two formulas, and this will be completely gauge invariant. These two descriptions can be understood as gauge fixed versions. Of this. OK, then we'll go to the string. So these things I will try to cover today. Then we'll discuss, of course, the superstring, which is the which is the main focus. And first we'll discuss vertex operators and tree amplitudes. So this will probably be done tomorrow. And then finally, we'll discuss multi-loop amplitudes. To do this, we'll have to introduce some new degrees of freedom that I'll describe, non-minimal. And this will require a construction of something called a B-ghost. And with this, we'll be able to compute multi-loop amplitudes. OK, so what I won't have time to discuss in these lectures are curved backgrounds. But um, if you're interested, you can look at previous lectures on that. So let me give you some references. OK, so as I already mentioned, there'll be notes on the web page. But you can look at earlier lectures I gave, for example, These are some lectures I gave here. And there's some lectures at GGI. And there's a new paper that's discussing these twister results. So that's, there's no review of that, but hopefully this paper is readable. And the multi-loop amplitudes, the most recent uh, results are by Umberto Gomez and Carlos Mafra. So this is their three-loop paper, um, which is OK, so if you can't see something I wrote from writing too small, just please stop me and tell me to write bigger. So is everything OK up to now? Any questions? OK, so motivation. So 
So as you will hear, uh, certainly from Ashok, the usual description of the superstring uses the RNS form as Ramon Neva Schwartz. So Ramon Neva Schwartz formalism has the advantage that it, it, it's a very simple idea. It's you extend the bosonic string variables to spinning string variables by extending the, conf the conformal invariants or the reparameterization invariants to world sheet super conformal invariants or world sheet super reparameterization invariants by introducing these Grassmann coordinates, which I'll call kappa and kappa bar. So this is, of course, a super field. And if you expand, expand it out, you get, of course, bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom. So these are commuting, and these are anti-commuting. So I'll always use fermionic to mean anti-commuting. Some people use fermionic to mean spinorial. That I don't use that language. So, okay. so this is, of course, a space-time vector. Okay. So although it's anti-commuting, it's a fermion, it's a space-time vector. This is an auxiliary field, which okay, the equation of motion is that it's zero, so maybe you're not used to seeing that. OK, so psi m is a world sheet spinner. So this has spin plus a half. This has spin minus a half. So it has half integer spin as a world sheet variable. So psi m, psi bar. But they're, of course, space-time vectors. Now, if you think about spin statistics, it's natural to have spinorial. So that's fine. It's a world sheet spinner. It has the normal statistics as a world sheet variable, but it has the opposite spin statistics for a space-time variable. So what this means is the world sheet properties act very simply. They just act by world sheet supersymmetry. They mix x and psi. But under space-time supersymmetry, it transforms in a complicated way. So the space-time, I'm not going to go into detail, although I Ashok probably will go into some detail about the space-time supersymmetry generator. If he doesn't, I'll do it later. Um, you have to bosonize these fields. So it's, it acts in a nonlinear way of just sketching how it looks, you have to bosonize the beta gamma ghosts, which are the world sheet ghosts for this space-time world sheet supersymmetry. And you also have to bosonize the psi. So this is some kind of spin field. It transforms as a space-time spinner. That's why I've given this alpha index. So m equals 0 to 9 is a vector index. And alpha equals 1 to 16 is a spinner index. So this would be a, a Majorana vial spinner, depending on how the choices of plus and minuses here. Now, the algebra here is not quite the supersymmetry algebra. It's, this turns out to be related to the translation generator by picture changing. So it's times some other operator, let's call it y, picture lowering operator. Now I'm not going to go into detail of this, but you can see that the space type supersymmetry transformations are complicated. Okay, what this means is that it's complicated, for example, to compute scattering amplitudes involving external fermions or external states which carry space-time spinner indices. So anything that carries space-time vector indices is, is easy to describe. But anything which carries space-time spinner indices is going to be complicated to describe. So for example, using this formalism up to now, What has been computed is 4.2 loop amplitude. So this is Do Kuen Fong. Okay. 
but only with external Nova Schwartz or only with external bosons. The technology for computing with external fermions, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's a technical problem or a conceptual problem. It hasn't been worked out yet. Furthermore, it's unknown how to describe Ramon Ramon backgrounds. Now, it might be possible tomorrow that somebody will figure out how to do this, but up to now it's unknown. And these are, of course, crucial for ADS-CFT. And the problem is essentially that the Ramon states are complicated in the same way as this space-time supersymmetry generator is complicated. Furthermore, it's difficult to verify finiteness properties or non-renormalization theorems. And the reason is simple. It's because one needs to one needs to sum over spin structures. So before summing over spin structures, the amplitudes are not space-time supersymmetric. And of course, these finiteness properties depend crucially on space-time supersymmetry. Finally, there's a a question which is, if you want to compute the amplitude, not just the momentum dependence of the amplitude, but the overall factor multiplying the amplitude, it's unknown in the RNS how to compute the overall factor. So for a genus greater than one. Now this coefficient is important if you want to test certain duality conjectures. The reason in RNS it's unknown how to compute this is because when you work in the RNS formalism, you have BC, you have beta gamma goats, you have these psi's, they all have different conformal weights. And what happens is the determinants that you get from doing the partition function over these fields of different conformal weights They, of course, enter into the partition function, and it's not clear how to um, compare them. Essentially, you need different regularizations for each determinant, and um, it's, it's not known how to compute that overall coefficient in the RNS form. Okay, so these are, of course, the main advantage of RNS is this world sheet supersymmetry. We can describe many different kinds of backgrounds. But the difficult features, as I said, because as soon as you describe things with space-time spinner indices, the amplitude become, uh, the, the formalism becomes complicated to deal with. Uh, can people see down here if I write here? Yes, please. Yes? Yes? So, yes, but if you, so if you can use unitarity, of course to try to fix this. So uh, Do Quinn Fong showed how to do this for two loop. It's not obvious how to do that for the three loop, for example. At least nobody has sh shown how to get that coefficient from unitarity. But, um, but in any case, in using pure spinner, of course, unitarity is not manifest in any of these formalisms. Unitarity is only manifest in light cone gate. Um, now, in the pure spinner formalism, you can directly compute it. So you can just check the two loop. Of course, if it, if a two loop, if it gave the wrong answer, it would mean that unitarity is somehow violated. The formalism is wrong. But actually, Mafra and Gomez computed the three loop and showed that it's consistent with duality. So, sorry, you can't see down there, is that right? OK, so let me. Um, OK, so the summary. RNS is that if we're looking at, for example, the open string, there are four different sectors of the superstring. 
We have the sector called GSO plus, which contains, for example, the vector. The, let's do the open string. So we have open string, we have the tachyon, we have the massless vector, and then we also have the Ramon states of different chiralities and also all the massive states. So the GSO plus sector is the one containing, for example, the massless vector. The GSO minus sector is the one containing the tachyon. Then we also have the Neve Schwartz and the Ramon sector. Okay, so we have four different sectors for the, for the superstring in the open string case. If we do a closed string, we get four times four, 16. Okay, so here's the vector, here's the tachyon. Of course, what one can also have, so this is the vector. This is the tachyon here. They're in the Neve Schwartz sector. In the Ramon sector, we can have GSO plus, which would be like Majorana vial. And here would be Majorana antivial. So just these are some examples of states in these different sectors. The Ramon formula, uh, the RNS formalism is good for describing things in this Neve Schwartz sector, either GSO plus or GSO minus. It's good for describing tachyons, it's good for describing vectors. Good means it's simple. I don't mean, of course, it's good in the sense that tachyons are objects you want to get rid of. I just mean that in the RNS formalism, it's easy to handle them. Whereas in the Ramon sector, either GSO plus or GSO minus, RNS is not the way to go. Okay? It's messy. Okay? Now what we'll see is that there's another description of the string using either Green-Schwartz or pure spinner formalism, in which So if RNS is blue, and green Schwartz is green, RNS is good in the Neve Schwartz GSO plus and GSO minus. Green Schwartz is good in the GSO plus Neve Schwartz, and also GSO plus Ramon. Okay? Whereas it's not good in this GSO minus either Neve Schwartz or Ramon sector. Okay, so this is the difference between the two formalisms. Essentially, the, the formalism is supposed to be equ equivalent, of course. The amplitude is supposed to agree for anything you compute. But the computations are much simpler using Green Schwartz or pure spinners in these two sectors, whereas RNS is better for these. So, for example, we can describe curved backgrounds easily. In RNS with vectors or tachyons, in Green Schwartz or pure spinner, we can describe curved backgrounds easily in GSO plus, Neve Schwartz or Ramon backgrounds. Okay, so this is an important difference to remember. And of course, if we want to describe space time supersymmetric theories, Green Schwartz pure spinner is much better because we want to describe these sectors. In general, we want to avoid the GSO minus sectors. So, um, okay, so that's. The main difference between the RNS and the space time super. Can you describe GSO minus sector in Yes, but it's just as messy as describing Ramon sector in, in uh, RNS. So you have antiperiodic thetas, then you have to have spin fields in order to construct uh, the, the GSO minus sector. Okay, are there any other questions? OK, so the next thing I'm going to discuss is uh, the motivation for doing this pure spinner or green Schwartz technique. So everything I write down here should be in the notes. So you don't have to copy, but at least uh, try to ask questions. Okay, unlike the RNS formalism, Green Schwartz or pure spinner formalism, so I'll use PS for pure spinner, space time supersymmetry is now manifest. The way to do that is that instead of starting with a 
a world sheet superfield. Now you introduce XM and fermionic space-time spinner variables. And these transform in the usual way under space-time supersymmetry. So. OK, so now is a good time to introduce notation. So my gamma matrices, m is always 0 to 9, alpha is 1 to 16. These matrices here will be symmetric in alpha and beta. And they're related to the 32 by 32 matrices in this way. So alpha and beta can either be down or up. So if something is, has an index up, like theta alpha, it's called Majorana vial, or more precisely vial. Whereas if it has a down index, so let's call it kappa, this would be called antivial. So you can see gamma matrix with two up indices, it takes something antivial to vial. And something with two down indices takes vial to antivial. So of course, the gamma matrices change the, changes the chirality. And this would be a 32 by 32 gamma matrix. So in four-dimensional notation, this would be what was usually called the gamma matrices. And these would be the Pauli matrices. Okay. So this is, of course, in a certain representation. I'm only going to use this representation. So of course, the usual gamma matrix relation, gamma m, gamma n, equals 2 a to mn. This translates into this language here, gamma m alpha beta, gamma n beta gamma. If you symmetrize in m and n, it gives you 2 delta alpha gamma. Okay. So you always, you can, there's no metric which raises in lower indices because these are different representations of SO91. Yes? Say it louder, please. Delta of x is minus 1 half epsilon. Delta theta is epsilon. No. So supersymmetry, so in four dimensions, if you remember Wes and Bagger, so the supersymmetry transformation is of this type, d d theta alpha plus I guess minus one half gamma m theta alpha d d x m. So this is just the action of epsilon alpha q alpha. So epsilon is the Grassmann parameter associated with the space time supersymmetry in this direction. OK, so just sits theta. What you're probably thinking of is the RNS world sheet supersymmetry transformation. So in RNS, the supersymmetry transformation of world sheet is delta x m. In this case, it, um, epsilon is a space-time scalar. So it's just epsilon psi m plus epsilon bar psi bar m. And delta psi m is equal epsilon d, d, z of x, n. So here, yes, psi transforms into x. But this is the world sheet supersymmetry. This is not space-time supersymmetry. OK, it's a good question because these are the best kinds of questions. Because this is a question that probably half of you have, but uh, somebody has to ask it. OK? So are there any other questions? OK, so this is the space-time supersymmetry generator. And as you can see, Q alpha with Q beta using the anti-commutation relations of theta and dd theta, it's easy to see this is equal to minus 1 half d dx of gamma m. Uh, sorry, minus, yeah, I guess that's right. So this is the 
No, there's no. There's no half yet. Because you get it twice. Okay, so this is the uh, the usual anti-commutator two space-time supersymmetries gives you a translation. Okay, so this is the gamma matrix relation. There's another identity which is useful to know. These are the things you know just by reading about it. It's not easy to prove, but okay. Of course, by writing explicit representations of these gamma matrices, you can prove this. Uh, if you symmetrize in any three indices here in 10 dimensions, this turns out to be zero. So this is just for d equals 10. For those that are interested, this is related to division algebras. So this is true in 3, 4, 6, and 10 dimensions, which is related to the real complex quaternionic octonionic division algebras. OK, so these are identities which will be useful to know. Yes, thank you. OK, so are there any questions about this? For those that don't know, of course, you can do fields. Uh, you can decompose any, fo any form constructed from vector indices in terms of these gamma matrices. So gamma MNP turns out to be anti-symmetric in alpha beta. So any object which is anti-symmetric in the spinner indices can be decomposed in terms of a three form. And any object which is symmetric in its spinner indices, a bispinner, can be decomposed in terms of a one form and a five form. This five form is um, self dual. OK, so this is a notation which we'll use throughout the, the lectures. Okay, any questions on the notation? OK, so this is the space-time supersymmetry. Of course, the action will be manifestly invariant under this. It turns out that the Green-Schwartz formalism, although it's much older than the pure spinner formalism, it has only been quantized in light cone gauge. which makes life complicated if you want to compute scattering amplitude. So covariance, Lorentz covariance is not manifest. And of course, it also makes it difficult to describe curved backgrounds. So up to now, this has only been used to compute tree level and one loop five point amplitude. So Green and Schwartz computed the tree level four point and one loop four point, and I don't remember, but it's been extended for the tree level five point and one loop five point. Now, of course, you can do these uh, five point amplitudes for any external states. You're not restricted to external bosons. The, the, the amplitudes uh, treat the bosons and fermions the same way. In pure spinner formulas, which we'll see later, you can quantize covariantly. So all the symmetries are manifest, which has made it useful for computing um, multi-loop amplitude. Of course, both of these formulas can be used to describe Ramon backgrounds. In pure spinner, you can covariantly quantize these backgrounds, so that's an advantage. Finite network properties are easy to verify. Essentially because you don't have to do the sum over spin structures, the space-time supersymmetry is manifest. And furthermore, one can explicitly compute, for example, this overall coefficient. Essentially because all the determinants cancel. It's something like a topological string in that sense. So as I already mentioned, Mafra and Gomez, and Gomez and Mafra, 
computed the three loop four point. Of course, for any external states, any external massless states, and checked the S duality conjecture. So there's an S duality conjecture for, for this amplitude. It's a D to the sixth R to the fourth term. And they computed this coefficient. Okay, and that coefficient is related to the tree amplitude coefficient of that term by S duality. OK, so that was, that's an impressive computation. Now, up to now, where these formalisms come from has been a bit of a mystery. Of course, Green Schwartz just presented this. First, they presented the formalism in light cone gauge. And light cone gauge is a very simple formalism. We'll see that in it later. Um, covariantly, it's a bit more complicated. It's nonlinear even in a flat background. But they showed that uh, you can gauge fixed to light cone gauge. So they convinced everybody the formalism was correct. But as I already mentioned, people haven't been able to covariantly quantize it. And we'll see a bit later why. The pure spinner formalism can be quantized covariantly, but it's only written down in conformal gauge, at least up to now. So it involves a BRST operator in conformal gauge, which is good enough to compute amplitude. But the question is, where does this BRST operator come from? So what is the symmetry that this BRST operator is gauge fixed? So that's what, that's what we'll see um, in the following. It will turn out that it's gauge fixing a twister-like symmetry. So the generator of this symmetry is going to be something like p slash lambda equals 0. This is a twister constraint. I'll explain later why. And it will turn out that the fermionic variables here, which are world sheet, they're space-time spinners, so this is, of course, as you want, because it's fermionic. But it's a world sheet scalar. Which is surprising. Just like in the INS, it was surprising it was a space-time vector. Now, it will turn out that when you start with this approach here, this twister constraint, it will turn out that the thetas is the Fadeya pop of ghosts for these constraints. So the fact that it's a world sheet scalar is now explained from the fact that it's, from the, on the world, from the world sheet point of view, it's a ghost. It's not a matter variable. So that's a new interpretation of this Green-Schwartz formula. And what I'll show next, well, after I describe these superparticles, I'll show how to get these Formalism, there's two different gauge fixed versions of this formalism with a twister like constraint. OK, so that's the motivation. So, are there any questions before I start with the formalism? So, as I said, um, the whole point of this is to interact. So, so please ask questions. Otherwise, Yes? Good. OK, good question. Thank you. Yeah, so the question is why we only have forms here of odd dimension. We don't have any forms of even dimension. So as I mentioned here, a gamma matrix, which is a one form, it's either raised in indices or lower indices. So indices of, so objects which have this, 
indices of the same chirality, they will only involve, obviously, because gamma matrices have either up or down, an odd number of these. So it can either be gamma M, gamma MNP, gamma MNPQR, or you could go on to seven forms, but the seven form is dual to this, et cetera. Okay. Now, if we have something with an up index and a down index, then it can be expressed in terms of things with even indices. So, for example, this can be expressed in terms of delta alpha beta, something with two indices, which would have one up and one down, or something with four indices. So if you want to write a form with an even number of indices or a bispinner, which would be a bispinner with one up and one down. Okay. So this is in 10 dimensions. Of course, in different dimensions, things are different. But I mean, 10 dimensions, this is how it works. OK, these are excellent questions. Any other questions? OK, so the next thing I'm going to do is give you an introduction to first the Green-Schwartz superparticle and the pure spinner superparticle. Okay, so obviously there's no point in doing the string if you don't understand the particles. So let me start with the green shorts. So this is going to describe the massless states of the open string, which is, of course, 10-dimensional super Yang mills. One can ask what happens if you work in lower dimensions. And I don't want to go into details, but the answer is not so clear. If there are questions, I can, of course, go into detail. So the action is, of course, going to be invariant under this space-time supersymmetry, the one that I just erased. And it's because it's a superparticle, it's just an integral over tau. So just to remind you, if I'm doing a massless particle, the simplest way to describe it is with a constraint of this type. So E would impose, this is the, you could think of this as the one-dimensional Virbein or just the Lagrange multiplier, which imposes the, the constraint that it's massless. Of course, if you want it too massive, you just put in a minus m squared. <coughs> but we're going to do the massless case. Of course, just for people who have never seen it in this first order form, if you're doing massive and you integrate out p, you just get the usual action of um, M squared. No, I think that's right. If mass is zero, of course, you, it doesn't make sense. So since we're only considering the massless case, we're going to use the first order form. And now this is not space-time supersymmetric, because as, if you remember, space-time supersymmetry transformations are delta theta equals epsilon L. So epsilon is a global. Parameter. It does not depend on tau. Now, to make this space-time supersymmetric, it's easy. You just add this term. So, of course, dot just means dd tau. OK, it's easy to show that this combination is invariant under this transformation if epsilon is constant. And as I showed to you earlier, this transformation, if you anti-commute to itself, it generates the translation. So Q alpha is dd theta alpha minus 1 half. Now, there's an additional symmetry of this action, which was called kappa symmetry. It was first found by Warren Siegel, which is a local symmetry. 
So it's a gauge symmetry, but it's fermionic. And it has the following form. So you introduce a fermionic parameter kappa, which depends on tau. Sorry, this should be an up ending. And you define delta xm. So delta theta is just this thing here. Okay. Now if you do this transformation, it's easy to see that this term here, let's call this term pi m. So this object is space-time supersymmetric. It's easy to see that delta pi m is equal to um, so I have to do the computation, sorry. So it's going to be equal to kappa p slash I did it correctly, let's see. Um, maybe I'll do it on the other side. Like this. So you might think there's a dd tau acting on kappa, but that cancels from the dd tau acting on x. What that means is that because p squared, p slash p slash is of course equal to p squared, that you have to shift you have to shift delta E in order to cancel the contribution. So the shift to delta E is just equal to 2. And I think I put a factor of 2 here in my notes. OK, so um, this is a local symmetry, which is called kappa symmetry. Any questions? So of course, local symmetries are implied that you have some generator, first class constraints. And to find the first class constraint, let's look at the canonical momentum to theta. So this is defined in the usual way by taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta dot. So let's call that small p. So capital P is, of course, the canonical momentum for x. So the canonical momentum for theta, if we do this computation, is going to be equal to minus 1 half pm gamma m theta. So it's not independent of theta, which means it's a constraint. So if we define d alpha to be equal to p alpha plus this is a constraint. So in Dirac's language, one needs to impose this constraint on the wave function. Now, of course, one has to figure out if this constraint is first class or second class. And if you use the canonical commutation relations that p alpha with theta beta is equal to delta alpha beta, then it's easy to compute that d alpha with d beta is equal to gamma m alpha beta pm, just because of the anti-commutator here. pm is not a constraint, which means that d alpha is part second class. However, p squared equals 0 is a constraint. So although pm is not a constraint, part of pm is. Now, what this, when you do the computation, you find that d alpha it splits up into eight first class constraints. And eight second class constraints. In order to covariantly quantize, one has to figure out what to do with these second class constraints. Second class constraints, usually you don't know how to quantize using BRST method. But what, what you can do is quantize in light cone gauge. So covariant quantization is a problem.
Of course, if you don't know how to covariant quantize, you don't know what the ghosts are. But one can quantize in light cone gauge. So that's what I'll describe here. So in light cone gauge, which is actually more appropriately called semi-light cone gauge, you use this kappa symmetry, this is a local symmetry, to gauge fix half of the theta is to zero. So you can do that because you have these eight first class constraints. So you have eight local symmetries. So you gauge gamma plus theta, which has eight independent components. Gamma plus is, of course, equal to, and gamma minus is equal to gamma zero plus or minus gamma nine. Furthermore, it's convenient to break SO8 down to U4. You don't have to do this, but it makes it easier to, to analyze the structure. So what happens is theta alpha has 16 components. That, of course, breaks up into gamma plus theta and gamma minus theta, which transform like SO8 chiral and antichiral spinners. So gamma, this one we're going to set to 0. This one we're going to split up further into U4. So under U4, this SO8 spinner splits up into a 4 and 4 bar. So I'll call it theta j and theta j bar, where j j bar equals 1 to 4. OK, so we've broken SO91 all the way down to U4. And now we're going to rescale theta j bar. We're going to define this to be um, 1 over p plus eta. So when you do that, this action so of course we still have this term here. But this term is going to only contribute when this p is in the minus is in the plus direction. So you're going to get a term plus p plus theta dot gamma minus theta. That's the only contribution just because you've gauged these thetas away. This is equal to theta plus a dot theta a dot, which now I can write in terms of these j and j bar and absorbing the p plus into the eta, this is equal to eta j bar theta j dot. OK, so this part is, of course, the same as before. Um, So this part I'm going to replace by this. OK, so now it's easy to quantize because we just have these three fields. So the wave function, of course, has to satisfy p squared equals 0 from this constraint. So the wave function is going to depend on x M. And it will depend on the thetas and eta's are, of course, conjugate. So it either depends on thetas or eta's, but not both. Just like here, it either depends on x's and p's, but not both. So if we're working in the theta space, it's a function of theta j. And now you can, of course, expand it just because these are fermionic variables. So it has a single component here, then it has a term. 
proportional to 1 theta, and it has a term proportional to 2 thetas, it has a term with 3 thetas. and a term with four theta. So it has 16 terms. Eight are bosonic and eight are fermionic. And these A plus, A, J, K, A minus are just the usual eight components of the on-shell components of the gluon in light cone gauge. So this is a 6 because it's anti-symmetric in J and K. And of course, the Xj and Xj bar are the two components of the, of the gluino. OK, so this is the quantization of the Green-Schwartz superparticle in light cone gauge. Of course, it's not covariant. I've broken it down to U4. OK, any questions? Yes, please. One second, please. And, uh, here, I don't understand clearly why it's going to move into two eight eight constraint there. Ah, here eight eight. Okay. Eight Very good. Okay, so p squared equals zero yes. implies that. Uh, let's choose a reference frame just to simplify the notation. So let's suppose the momentum is in the p plus direction. Okay, so uh, the cons the the algebra here is. Um, D with D here is equal to P. So if P is only non-zero in the P plus direction, then you have D alpha with D beta is equal to gamma um, plus alpha beta P plus. So I have to tell you what this gamma matrix is. This gamma matrix, let me just finish this. Because the gamma matrix turns out to be um, uh, it has 16, it's a 16 by 16 matrix, but it turns out that half of these components, is, it only has a non-zero component in, in, this note, in this component here. So it's gamma plus A dot B dot. So all of these other corners are zero. This is an 8 by 8 matrix. So that's why um, only Eight, there are only eight second class constraints. Okay. Now, of course, this was in the, this was assumed that P plus was the only non-zero component. Of course, if I do a Lorentz transformation, that doesn't change the, the rank of the matrix. OK, there was another question? Same question. OK, any other question? Yes? So cannot is too strong. So this was, of course, developed in the 80s. Um, and the covariant Green-Schwartz action was written in the early 90s. So for about 10 years, people struggled with how to write this, how to covariantly quantize this. Okay, so the main uh, exercise was to convert these second class constraints into first class constraints. So once you can convert these second class into first class, if you can write the first class theory in a covariant way, then you can use the usual BRST method. Okay. So there were many attempts uh, for the superparticle, there were a few that succeeded, but none of these methods for the superparticle extended for the string. So of course, for the string, there's a similar situation. You have eight first arcs and eight second class, but the, 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 commu the, the variables here are more complicated. So none of the methods which were successfully used for the superparticle involving infinite set of ghosts for ghosts or um, various methods. I shouldn't say, there was one method which uh, was generalized to the string using an different set of ghosts for ghosts by Siegel and uh, Lee, Lee and Siegel. Um, but it was so complicated that they couldn't compute. Well, they computed some amplitudes, but not many. So I can't say uh, there are no methods to covariantly quantize, but I think it's fair to say there are no good methods for to covariantly quantize. Are there any other questions? Yes? OK, so we're, that's right. So we're doing the superparticle. So the superparticle, of course, if it's uh, described just at the free level, 
So free just means that it's not interacting. Then it just describes super Maxwell. So it's just uh, U1. So these are just linearized fields. If you want, you can introduce Chan Payton factors and have it start to interact. OK, now for the string, it's completely natural to do that. And the Chan Payton factors you put at the end of the string. And open string, of course, we can describe any gauge. Up to anomalies, we can describe any gauge group. And there are anomalies, I shouldn't say any. There, there are conditions on the gauge group in string theory. Okay. For the superparticle, you can put in Chan Payton factors, but describing interacting superparticles is another story that I don't want to get into. So at the moment, just consider it to be super Maxwell. But when we do the string, of course, it will generalize to super Yang Mills. But there are no conditions for the superparticle. In principle, if I'm looking at the linearized theory, of course, super Maxwell and super Yang Mills are completely the same. You just add multiple copies of super Maxwell and you get super Yang Mills. Okay. Other questions? OK, so the pure spinner formula. So let me just um, spend, I'll just write down Lagrangian and then I'll stop. Lagrangian for the pure spinner is going to be start out similar, P and X. But instead of writing down an action just in terms of P, X, and theta, we're going to introduce a conjugate momentum for theta, just like we have for X. So P alpha will be an independent degree of freedom. It's usual first order form. And then we're going to introduce some ghosts. So we're not going to try to write down the world line reparameterization invariant action. We'll do that later today. We're just going to write down what we call the gauge fixed action. So you introduce an additional variable, lambda and w. And the idea is that this action is supposed to describe super Yang mills in a covariant way. In order to do that, you need a BRST operator. So I'm just going to save in two minutes. And then this afternoon, I'll explain this in more detail. So this is, of course, equal to d alpha, the same d alpha that we had before. <coughs> But now d alpha is not 0, because p alpha is an independent variable. It doesn't satisfy Dirac constraint. So in some sense, this is what you might try to construct if you were, somebody gave you green Schwartz. It's constraint times ghost. That's the BST operator. But of course, the constraint is not first class. So what you find is that q squared, instead of being 0, is equal to lambda gamma m lambda times pm, right? because I'm using this constraint this relation here. In order to make q squared 0, this variable here has to be constrained. So the constraint will be lambda gamma lambda equals 0. And this is what Cartan called a pure spinner in D. OK, so this is the answer. And this afternoon, I'll explain where this answer comes from. OK, so I'll stop there for questions.